I don't just want to remember Hestia, nor lose more future remembering, forgetting. February Hestia skipped entirely, slept, hibernating whole years without remarking on their leap days, dragging time-stained laughter out its cellar because I can't find any new jokes. I don't just want to imagine either, though I do want that like sugar, but dread to be left without teeth. Each of us seems attuned to the electric buzz of our own handmade void. I don't want to want or not want, just to be a little unburdened by the present, Hestia, to eat once more in a cafeteria, Hestia. Hey everyone, welcome back to Soul Scene, the podcast where we imagine a beautiful, sustainable, tactile feature. This week we're going to be continuing our series, populating the Soul Scene Mount Rushmore, which consists of people who really inspire us and we think will inspire the humans who will populate the beautiful future. This is an exceptional week because we've both chosen a fictional character. Everyone else to this point has been human or animal who actually existed. Yep. Not this week, though. Yeah, I kind of gave mine away in the opening poem. It's Hestia. I feel like a goddess kind of blurs the line between real and fictional. I didn't Mm want to, I mean, no offense to anybody who is worshipping the gods of Mount Olympus, but my first introduction to Hestia at least was through the Percy Jackson series. So she's mm-hmm. much more of a character to me than she is a living, breathing deity. But also, along with going in the lineage of our taking inspiration from real people this semester, I think it's a little bit inspired or aligned with this phenomenon we've noticed, which really feels exacerbated by the internet or just the age of pop culture that we live in. People identifying so much with characters from fiction, particularly movies we're doing a solo scene spin on it where they aren't necessarily people that we identify with more people that are aspirational figures i guess Mm -hmm. and just as with the rest of the semester we'll be trying to pull lessons out from their lives or their mythos in my case which are not just personal or self-help but also kind of infrastructure i guess or as widely applicable as possible to a utopia Yeah, we haven't gone through the step-by-step guide of what Einstein did in his morning routine. However, that's interesting. But so far, that hasn't been the more practical angle we're taking. We're taking, Mm. as you said, more of a society-wide, universalizable lessons from people's lives because not everyone's going to be able to wake up at 4 a.m. or not everyone's going to be able to donate a bunch of money to a cause. But everyone can be kinder. Everyone can be more curious, what have you. So it's more thematic. Yeah. Did you have any of those characters growing up? I know the one that you chose today will be an example, but did you have any kind of honorable mentions of people from books or movies that kind of inspired you? Wait, I know one. I know about Caillou. Inspired (laughs) you in a negative way, but affected you in any case. Yeah, that's true. Because you said that the first tantrum you remember throwing was inspired by watching Caillou do the same thing on a TV show. It was actually DW. Oh, excuse me. Who inspired probably my only tantrum. And it was just me in my room and I like looked around. I wasn't even angry. And I like took my pillow and I threw it on the ground. I was like, ah. (laughs) And I was like, because that's what she did in the TV show, Arthur. And that was about the extent of my rage in my life, really. But I was very naive and influenced by everything to like probably a weird point yeah but as I'll talk about today I definitely went through like this is so bad but like I feel like every kid growing up in the early 2000s went through like a world war ii phase where they were just like really interested in reading the dear Canada books if you're from Canada and maybe other countries have similar they're basically this series of books about girls usually age like eight to 16 and each one is written from their perspective as a diary going through a different historical event a lot of them as I said are like during World War II but many Mm -hmm. of them are not some are War of 1812 (laughs) like there's a whole bunch of various other historical military excursions yeah so I feel like those weirdly influenced me to be very like Little House in the Prairie I guess that's also another I didn't watch Little House in the Prairie growing up but just I was always very like homely like I wanted to make bread and plant flowers and I feel like even from a young age that's the most those types of characters always influenced me the most yeah and I have another thing that just came to mind which is so like so cringe but funny again so I'll share it in (laughs) the first Hunger Games book (laughs) so Katniss was an inspiration no not Katniss 
pita. Right, the bread <laughs> Again, guy. Again, baked bread. But I remember he said like he always ties his shoes twice or something in the book. Oh, no. And for years I like tied my shoes, like double knotted them. Yeah. Well, it this is imp- actually, yeah. this is one of the notes I wanted to say for this episode. Because even though, as I mentioned, we've we've gone to almost to pains at times to not make these biographical or just kind of individual lessons, these episodes. Like mm-hmm. we're not just trying to learn to live like Shakespeare. We're trying to take themes from Shakespeare's life, how we can apply them to an ideal future or, or imagine kind of like that. But at the same time, it is, we are kind of building a composite ideal person. And then I was thinking, we're just doing that formally for an hour a week on solo scene right now. But we do that informally our entire life, everyone we meet, or maybe this is just me kind of being sociopathic, but you meet people. No, but you know, like I like to eavesdrop, like having a kind of rightly detached observation. That's at least how I think most people view people like that though, right? Like you, you pick and choose, oh, I like that about this person. I'll try and talk like that. I remember there was one kid in school who I just mimicked my entire writing, like my, uh, my printing based Mm -hmm. off of them. Not the prose, but the style of shaping each letter. That's how you become a human is you steal little bits and yeah, pieces. Exactly. Like baking, again, is a good example of like obviously your recipes and the things you eat, you weren't born with them. Mm-hmm. So perhaps we cook our mom's shepherd's pie, yeah. make my friend's tea, all of these different things. And that's how you build a personality as well, even appearance wise, but internally how you react to things, you perhaps see someone respond to grief in a really graceful way and then you kind of try and internalize that and then you have a friend who just gets really excited over butterflies and flowers and stuff and that's something that I've that's where I learned how to love nature in this like really pure way because before that I was just like yeah it's nature it's beautiful but seeing someone like cry over a bit blade of grass <laughs> really impacted me and it won't impact everyone but it's yeah. it's fun and because we don't really live with other real humans now, it tends to be more shaping it based on characters and perhaps online personalities. Yeah, I think that's the exercise that we're doing in Zoocene right now. We're kind of expanding that to a historical basis. For instance, with the how do people deal with grief? Oh, I'll try and absorb some of that. You can do it from your dad or you can do it after reading Marcus Aurelius. Like, mm-hmm. and we're doing much more the latter on this podcast. So, Hestia, what do you know about her? Have you ever read Percy Jackson? the most seminal work of Greek mythology. Mm. I didn't read Percy Jackson. I did, however, partake in a reenactment of the first book. Okay. She only pops up in the fifth book, Okay, which is the final. So basically, I'll describe my introduction to her through that series. She was presented not as this kind of all-powerful god like the other ones on Olympus. She appears in the fifth as this, I think she's like a young girl. And she's remarkably subtle, so I remember, for that kind of young adult's fantasy fiction. And how she's kind of presented is she's like, she basically maintains the equilibrium on Mount Olympus. She's almost like a lodestone. And because the tide is kind of turning for and against them in this epic war that concludes the series, she is losing her fame is basically the the metaphor Um, which is taken straight from Greek mythology because she represented the hearth. Mm. Actually, Hestia means hearth in Greek. And just as her role is kind of small in Percy Jackson, in the great dramas of the Greek mythology and the various affairs and hijinks that all those gods got up to, she is really kind of minimized. She doesn't play a massive part in those stories. And part of this is because she's one of the three chaste goddesses. So since most of the stories base around romance and affairs, she's absolved from all of that. But also when I was reading, it seems like part of her personality is being just a little bit gentler and away from the drama. So as goddess of the hearth, she played a significant role in kind of domestic life in ancient Greece Mm -hmm. because the family, the house was often centered around the hearth I think often literally, like it was the middle of the house and there was this kind of symbolism where it was attached to the earth, obviously, and the sky because it's essentially a fireplace and so it provides warmth and cooking and in those days, that kind of thing wasn't just in a, an oven that you bought from, you know, some random store. But also connecting that family life to 
civic life, which was kind of viewed as an extension of it, every town hall had one of these hearths. And every time they went to a new town or built a new building like that, they would carry the flame from it, similar to the Olympic flame. And she was, in that sense, the most integral to those kind of seemingly ordinary or under the radar uh, structures, the mm. household, the functioning civility of the town. And for that reason, she's often kind of viewed as the goddess of home and of family. And also something that's really notable is that every time there was a sacrifice to one of the other gods, Zeus, Poseidon, Athena, whoever, the first part was always given to Hestia. Of course, she's the flame. She's the yeah. heart, really. It's interesting because all of the other gods are so elemental in the sense that some of them are literally lightning, the tides, war, peace, love. But then Hestia is the only god that really lives in the home, in the person. It's this similar to Jesus of like, he was the version of God that lives inside of the individual. Hestia is the heart of the home. When I was a kid, I used to picture Jesus as like literally living inside of my heart organ because that's how they metaphorically said it. And I think it's funny because it, it's a similar vision of what I'm having of Hestia. I've heard just like literally living in the fireplace, having a little doorway mm -hmm. that she just pops in and out of and then Oh, the flyer's going low. I need to like blow on it. Yeah. Being that gentle and small, but also quite a force. As we know, fire and food and all of this stuff is what keeps us alive. I saw her best described as a spiritual anchor. And mm -hmm. from a little of her personality, I actually think the, the Christ analogy seems to work a little bit. I mean, at least among the other gods of Olympus, she seems like the kindest and the gentlest or known as such. There was a story about how she may have even ceded her spot on Olympus to Dionysus, um, but I, I couldn't find a source for that. She's also technically the firstborn of the gods, but she's often, she's kind of narratively the youngest because obviously the gods were born and then Kronos, their titan father, ate them one by one. Mm -hmm. And Zeus, the youngest born god who managed to elude being swallowed, made Kronos vomit up his siblings and they were kind of in reverse order. So Hestia was the last to be reborn, AKA vomited. So that's a little bit about her mythos. The reason I chose her is illustrated a little bit in that poem I started the episode with, or at least I hope it's shown there. And it's this kind of confused, almost melancholy or like yearning that I've been feeling recently. A big part of it is that we are moving in a few months and we haven't even been in Montreal for that long. It's only been a few years and it's this feeling of being a little bit nomadic or maybe a little bit too nomadic for one's liking. And I guess to get a bit personal, having immigrated at a young age, like I never felt that kind of hearth, home, land, person connection. And... I was kind of getting a little bit woe is me, but then I thought, actually, I think most people today can relate to this. I think we all, we are all too nomadic for our liking. And this doesn't have to mean literally moving around. In fact, it might manifest as more being more still than ever in history, but because we are kind of digital citizens in a sense, I feel like we don't have that connection to the land that Hestia kind of embodies. So for instance, I was thinking when we leave Montreal, I don't know if I will miss it as much as I want to, if that makes sense. I see. Because the things that occupy our, occupy our time here, making a podcast, recording, watching movies, you know, doing things on, online is the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. You'll miss certain things, but I don't think we feel as immersed in the literal place of it as we might have done if we lived 2000 years ago. That makes sense. And perhaps a lesson you can take from Hestia when it comes to combating that sense of listlessness is creating some kind of physical token of the home 
no matter where you are, because even when you live in a city, you're often moving amongst different spaces, apartments, and so on, because you're not buying a house. I liked the image of carrying the flame from one hearth to yeah. the next. So obviously there's no actual flame, but the only thing we're going to take with us when we move is like our phones and our laptops. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that is, in a sense, the center of the home, the way that a hearth used <laughs> so to be. So sad. It is sad. Well, I, so. think it's, I think it's also, there's a family aspect to it. I recently was reading a book called Out of Egypt this week that I just finished. And it's a memoir about kind of many generations, like spanning a hundred years worth of a family and their their kind of exploits over time in the city of Alexandria, which they weren't native to. And they're often faced with leaving, but nonetheless, they really make the most of their time there together. Like often it, it will describe them as kind of clustered together in small apartments and often bickering and fighting. And there's a couple of times, because it's a memoir, it will kind of skip forward a few decades or a few years. Yeah. And sense. it will say as kind of a symbol of the the corruption of that family experience, it'll say like, now every time we have dinner, there's always someone listening to the radio. Or I love this one phrase that said, and we ate dinner that night um, a l'américain, which means in front of the television is the way they kind of mm-hmm. phrased it. And I was like, that kind of Simpsons image of them all sitting on the couch, because eating, you know, historically is such a kind of bonding thing for families, friends and communities. And if the person you're bonding with is like Ryan Seacrest, you know, it's a different thing. And I, I know that families can watch television together. I'm not saying television is the devil, but it's just kind of the symbol for how the Hestia has been lost. I'm yeah. using that kind of like a just a noun. Certainly. It's a good thing to begin thinking about and becoming aware of, perhaps for everyone listening and ourselves included, of finding something else to center the home around physically. Yeah. I think fireplaces are so cool. And it's like your family had one, which I really loved. And I'd always sit by with your dog <laughs> and like yeah. do schoolwork and stuff. She was the only one who really made the most of it. Yeah, we both did, really. And Yeah, but the dog would literally... <laughs> I mean, you would sit close to it because you have such a cold body, but she would lay just touching it, just with her feet it, touching it. Yes. We used to joke that it was like a, a pig being roasted and you could smell because she was very overweight. That's a really yeah. dark joke, actually. But It is, but, <laughs> you know, to each their own. Perhaps in recent times, the closest thing to a hearth is the kitchen. And I imagine in between when we were literally roasting on open fires Mm -hmm. and today when we microwave and we still cook in the kitchen but it's not the heart of the home the way it was even a generation ago i think the reason like there's a physical thing about the fireplace and the kitchen and the microwaves and you know all that but it's the it's a degradation more not just of the hearth but of the home itself Mm -hmm. like you and i will cook every single meal Mm -hmm. but we don't have a the kind of home i'm describing because we we live pretty much across a country from our families and i mean you mentioned today when we saw someone on sidewalk oh do they live in this building Mm -hmm. like we don't know your neighbors at all exactly so that's the kind of degradation that i think this is really speaking to and it's just about i don't want to sound too kind of cliche conservative but the family unit as the basis for that kind of community love i really think is the key to this where it's like you're not going to want to feel that engaged in politics or care so much about your neighbors if you don't engage that much, even with your own grandparents, that kind of thing. I might just be speaking to myself here. But. And it feeds in a little bit to this almost obsessive individualism or worship of the self that I touched on last week, where I described that gym culture and health and wellness is a little bit out of control, where I think people will treat therapy as so much of a, a almost a universal essential today. And I'm not necessarily disparaging that too much. But you do often wonder whether it's a replacement for things that might be free, might be, you know, easy and close and historically just norms. Mm. I agree. Because of the last few generations turning inwards, therapy has become an essential 
and hopefully within a generation or two, it will be back to communities being able to help people cope with certain problems and the problems will perhaps be less prevalent, period. And about the family being the unit of societies, I agree because family doesn't have to mean a nuclear family. It doesn't have to mean a mom and dad and two kids and a dog and a fish. But we basically, now you move to a city, I've seen this with all of my friends, they move here and they don't even form a friend group for a year or two. I mean, I didn't have friends the first year we moved here, so it was very much you and I. And of course, a couple can be a family, but you need some extended relationships. Well, it helps. Yeah. It helps a lot. This is, it, I think this is the core of pretty much why I chose Hestia because I was feeling a little bit homesick. And then when I kind of analyzed that, I was like, it's a little bit more like time sick, which is why I closed the, ep- closed the poem by saying to eat once more in a cafeteria or to have the burden of time relieved a little bit where adult life doesn't automatically provide you with camaraderie or people in the same boat like childhood did. Mm. And it's also very hard to form that organically as an adult. You have to be incredibly conscious and almost design it, which kind of takes away the magic of it anyway, but that's just the way we live now. And I think the cafeteria is a good metaphor because you just are all lining up, plating the same kind of food. It was one of my favorite things about living on campus and one of the things I missed the most. And it's not like this kind of hashtag adulting is so hard, like complaining that as we grow up, we have to take care of those things ourselves. When I say relieve the burden of time, it means to be surrounded by people and their own emergencies, gossip, and um, chores almost. You know what I mean? Where the 24 hours, 365 days a year, isn't just yours alone to fill by your own whim. It's also part of it is out of your control because your uncle just fell over. So it's like the texture of that month is like, we need to buy him a new knee. Yeah, I understand. (laughs) That makes sense. Yeah. Of when we... It comes back to convenience as well in a way of we're trying to make everything convenient, give ourselves more free time. Oh, we're only working four hours a day because we can do it really efficient using these AI digital tools. But is more time, more free time really what we need or is it? Well, the texture of the workplace is a good example. Like it could be akin to a classroom. Yeah. Where you're seeing the same people every day and you don't necessarily like them. That's almost beside the point. But they are doing things that aren't you. So the center of your universe isn't you is, is kind of part of it. And I think what's really sad is that with the internet today, providing such an ostensibly um, convenient substitution for this, people can go and I think will go 50, 60 years without really realizing the void they're trying to fill or what they're missing. Yeah, so I I'm agree. I'm happy that I feel like I'm kind of catching it at the age of 24. That is fortunate <laughs> for sure. And then just as a kind of addendum on the Hestia discussion, ancient Greece itself is a little bit off topic, but I feel like it's a neat Solacene inspiration. I really like the idea of having a golden age. I think it's incredibly practical and beautiful, even perhaps more so for being inaccurate or misremembered. You know what I mean? Like people will kind of go to pains to say, but ancient Greece wasn't actually all that and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just helpful to think that it was. Absolutely. In first year sustainability, they were talking a lot at the beginning of the course about Arcadia and every culture's different vision of this, of Eden, this basically pre-human time when everything was perfect. The golden age. And that clearly it never existed. There was never an actual perfect experience. But having one as a social, within our social consciousness is really important And we've stripped it away as we deny religion and as we deny, or not even deny, but as we find out, oh, ancient Greece wasn't actually all that. And then we almost dwell on that. So we take a kind of glee in it as well and like puncturing other people's optimism. Exactly. And why would we take glee in ruining people's childlike wonder? Because they have to drag everybody down (laughs) to their level. Exactly. But I think... 
in the soul scene. I mean, that's literally what the soul scene is, is creating this vision of a utopia we can look up to, look back to. It's <laughs> timeless in a way. It's creating something new, but of course, there's a lot of existing ones that we can look to. And everyone, it'll be different. For you, it's ancient Greece. And for lots of other people, it might be a different time period or a different type of society. But it's important to have because then you can point to it as, mm, what's wrong with this? Oh, it's unlike this. Maybe we could try this again. Yeah. Or as we're saying, pointing to a future that we're imagining. I think the reason it's so central to that optimism is because we can say, humans can get back to that because we won't, we were once like that. Society was once this good. Mm. And so it's been proven, which means I'm not just being foolhardy or something like that. We mm. went to Greece. We did. And it was, it was really cool, really yeah. awe inspiring to see art from like, there is this prehistoric stuff they had there. So it wasn't just like from the ancient Greek empire, but there were these, yeah, prehistoric little sculptures. Like yeah. those are probably like twenty thousand years old, and it's it feels humbling. like it feels like a kind of center. I mean, I know that's what Delphi is, is supposedly the center of the world, mm -hmm. and Hestia was kind of associated with that as well. But it's it's this area of like east meets west, past meets present, where just the aesthetic of it feels so magical. The color of the sky and the sea and the stone, even like even just seeing those that blue contrast with that gray kind of mm. takes you there and you can smell it and feel it without maybe it's because I love the Odyssey so much and every time I just <laughs> even just saying those words puts me on the ship with him. But I, I I really associate it with this aesthetic unity both of the the individual and collective soul and the world that they build around them which I don't feel so much when I walk around newer cities, which is a shame. But in Solacene, it will be aesthetically united, like the statues. I think the Greek statues, the reason they're so evocative is because one, they represent an ideal, and two, they contrast so much with NFTs. It's true. Because when you, when you think about it, like it's not just the really perfectly preserved statues and artifacts that are capture the imagination it's especially the ones that have lost a limb or like chipped a nose or chipped a finger because it means things age this is what the real world is like mm -hmm. and we need that kind of grounding yeah it's always unnerving when you see the recast versions of the sculptures as if this is what it would have looked like in all of its original glory it's unnerving in a way yeah, of they were painted yeah, yeah i don't, I don't like care <laughs> it's an interesting I want them fun white. fact i want them white and dusty <laughs> With them whitewashed. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't mean ethically. No, no, I mean the color. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> so the person that you chose for your fictional inspiration. It's weird how similar my person is to yours in that they also represent this ideal time. And also our young girl, obviously Hestia is an ageless goddess, but yeah. so is mine. So I chose what? Anne Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> From Anne of Green Gables. From Anne of Green Gables. I have a small question to start. Of course. Earlier you mentioned Little House on the Prairie. Yeah. Are Little House on the Prairie and Anne of Green Gables not the exact same thing? Because no. I always thought they I always just thought that was the same thing. No, no. Those are different stories. They're completely different stories. What? Not written by the same person, not set in the same place. In my head it's the same. Okay. So for anyone listening who maybe doesn't know about Anne Shirley, then you can just picture Little House on the Prairie and all of that. So Little House on the Prairie is like dusty, sandy. Yeah, it's more Americana. Okay, and Anne of Green Gables is set in Prince Edward Island. Canadiana. <whistles> Wait, so where do I start? I mean, Anne is basically my patron saint of literature because I was preparing for the episode, trying to think of fictional characters that really inspired me. I was going Gandalf. I was going all of these grand figures but then I realized I wanted someone who has a biography, like a date of birth and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. just for fun. And I also want someone, obviously, who embodies a lot of soul scene ideals. And then it hit me, Anne Shirley. So Anne was born in the fictional Boiling Brook, Nova Scotia. I was born in Nova Scotia, so obviously I identify with her. <laughs> On March 5th, 1866. How about this coming up? It's three it days is. away. Oh, my goodness. It's Maybe this will... be 150-something. Will... Yeah. So... She was born to parents Walter and Bertha Shirley, who were apparently school teachers, and they died when she was three months old from typhoid. What? Yeah. 
So Little Orphan Annie. Is, I guess I should mention I've never seen this. Yeah, so oh. I'm I yeah. have basically a synopsis. It is a long series. Lucy Maud Montgomery is the author and claims that Anne is not autobiographical, but it is the most autobiographical <laughs> work of fiction I've ever read, heard of. And I'll get more into why I know that and why it's commonly held later on. So Anne is orphaned at three months old and then moves in with their family's housekeeper who has 12 kids, all of whom are sets of twins. She was cursed by twins, she says. And so Anne was raised by her, but really was, once she reached a certain age, just a slave to them, helped them raise all the kids. And then when her kind of adopted dad dies all of the kids are pawned off because the mom who was like raising them all didn't want them Mm -hmm. and Anne was sent to an orphanage at the age of 10 11 and she was at the orphanage for four months until she was adopted who adopted her you may ask this is where things get booky so Anne of Green Gables the book starts in Prince Edward Island there is Marilla and Matthew Cuthbert are the adopted parents. They're siblings. They're not in a relationship. It's just like back then siblings would sometimes like live together for their whole lives. And so basically they're getting old. They need a little boy to come work and help them on the farm. They send word to the orphanage to say, great, we got you. But they send Anne instead of a boy. And so Matthew is very like quiet. He goes down to the train station to pick up Anne and she, he's like, well, you're not a boy, so what am I going to do? And he's very sweet and kind and doesn't say anything to her. He's like, why would telling an orphan that they're not wanted do any good? So she bring he brings Anne home to the farm for his evil sister to basically take care of and say, we didn't want you, da-da-da, because he didn't want to do the work. It sounds very convoluted so far. It, it kind of is. This evil is all within the first, like, four pages. Incestuous adopting parents. Yeah. So... <laughs> They take Anne back to the farm. They don't want her because they really need, they don't want a kid. They're not in a relationship. They're just running the heirloom farm that they have. But then they realize that if they get rid of Anne, their evil neighbor will take her. It's a lot of evil people in this. Yeah. So they were like, we don't want her to end up in the hands of this really cruel woman who's going to take Anne and beat the spirit out of her. I guess we'll keep her. It's like the gist of the first half of the book and then it goes on like Anne's entire life is documented in these books not just the first one there's a series and it goes on even to when she dies at the end of her life talks about her grandkids there's books about her grandkids her kids all of this and you read all that I haven't read it all okay um, you I've, watched it all. I've watched most of it there is not everything was put to film but there have been many film adaptations including a Miyazaki one. That's the only one I've ever seen. An yeah. episode of that anime from the 70s, I think. Yeah, so that's really a really good version of the book. The CBC TV movies are the best if you want to watch a movie. Okay. That was my favorite movie growing up. Every single year of my life, we would watch all three Anne of Green Gables movies on our way to Prince Edward Island, where we'd go for vacation. So we should mention, probably because most people don't know what that is, It's this tiny little, I think it's shaped almost like one of those tall or one of those small pointy weird um, misshapen sweet potatoes that you get. And I picture the island like a small sweet potato in Atlantic Canada (laughs) and similarly colored. I've never been there, but it's to me. Yeah, that's a good description. It's a sweet potato, right? Famous for their potatoes. Yeah. The soil is red. Exactly. And it is a province. It's not just like a tiny little spot. Like it's a proper province, even though it is very small it's like a hundred kilometers long the whole (laughs) province you can bike one end to the other in a day and so so the soul scene lessons from Anne of Green Gables I will start with the book itself and the story its impact on society the book was published in 1908 the industrial revolution was kicking off and everyone hated it as we know no one was like woo stink chariots stink chariots so this book was published as a sort of antidote to that a lot of Canadians apparently at the time, and dare I say, still today, really hated the way America was going. It was very industrial, it was clunky, and they felt like Canada represented this naive, peaceful, optimistic place. And this book really 
captured that energy. So even as it was written, it was a nostalgia piece. Exactly. Okay. So it was really written about Lucy's childhood on Prince Edward Island, where she grew up. She wasn't an orphan, but pretty much everything else is autobiographical. She went to Dalhousie University and went to a fictional Dalhousie University called Redmond. And it just, it was basically an autobiography. I was obsessed with living in Prince Edward Island because of this book. And I obviously never have. But Anne, just, she represents love, sociability, love of beauty, and optimism, creativity, all of these soul-esteem principles. So I'm going to read three segments from the book, and each time we can discuss the soul seenness of okay. that segment. So the first one is on the topic of imagination and optimism. This morning when I left the asylum, I felt so ashamed because I had to wear this horrid old wincy dress. All the orphans had to wear them, you know. A merchant in Hopetown last winter donated 300 yards of wincy to the asylum. Some people said it was because he couldn't sell it, but I'd rather believe that it was out of the kindness of his heart, wouldn't you? When you got on the train, I felt as if everybody must be looking at me and pitying me. But I just went to work and imagined that I had on the most beautiful pale blue silk dress. Because when you are imagining, you might as well imagine something worthwhile. And a big hat, all flowers and nodding plumes and a gold watch and kid gloves and boots. I felt cheered up right away and I enjoyed my trip to the island with all my might. So I seen. So I, spent, so seen. I liked the, I mean, there were two kind of I'd rather believes. And one was I'd rather believe he donated these out of the kindness of his heart rather than because he couldn't sell them. And the other was I'd rather believe that I was wearing this lovely dress and everyone was admiring me rather than kind of looking down on me. I like the former the most because I think it's uh, the least common today where mm -hmm. people, so much of when you talk to people and small talk is just let's get together and assume the worst of everybody. Oh, why is she wearing that? What's going on in their house? Or, you know, mm -hmm. why is, um, I don't know much about him, but he looks X or he seems Y. Yeah. Whereas, and we always say if a rich person is making a donation, oh, it's probably just for a tax write-off mm -hmm. or you'd never ever assume someone's doing something out of the kindness of their heart because there almost has to be an ulterior motive in the way that things are structured, but there often is an ulterior motive. Basically embrace naivety. And is it one of those stories where the innocent child goes around and kind of makes the grouchy adults feel young again? Is yeah, it like she that? basically sprinkles fairy dust. Okay, sprinkles because fairy dust, okay. as we know, the two people who adopted her, they were sick. They were no no longer able to farm, but then they obviously managed to do it for another like 10 years. So it's a little bit spirited away, a little bit Wizard of Oz-y mm -hmm. and maybe a lot Little House on the Prairie, whatever that is. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I think another interesting thing about Anne is that her personality swings from what she calls the depths of despair between the depths of despair and this like really lovely optimism. And she just feels things so fully because often when she's in the depths of despair, it's like she's tripped and scraped her knee or someone called her a name and she's like, oh, woe is me. But like she feels everything so fully and it's contagious to the reader and also to the characters in the book of letting yourself do that because we often numb ourselves to the good and the bad in a, in a way of trying to be more stoic, but a misrepresentation of what stoicism is, I think. Yeah. And... Yeah, so if you are numbing yourself, just try embracing the feelings and feeling them fully and then your reactions, like that's how stoicism works, is like the reactions are yeah are important. Stoicine recommends emotion? I don't know. Yeah. I've I think... been recently to your much to your displeasure, trying to reshape my laugh into something more hearty. Oh. <laughs> so but I think that would be a good idea. Like if more people instead of going like hee. So, like if you had to <laughs> if you See how it makes other people laugh too. Yeah, it's true. There's something there's something no. old fashioned about that. I think it's nice. He has a booming laugh. Yeah, I like that. Okay, one more thing about this quote before I move on to the next one is I liked how it's just such a soul scene thing of being like, oh, this road is gross. I mean, when I say soul scene, I mean an Aaron and Alicia thing. Yeah. Of instead of being like, this is actually gross, the amount of cars here, we're just like, imagine if there were trees and beautiful sidewalks and birds mm -hmm. and i think it helps you survive it's one of the many 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 reasons i i don't like the idea of 
augmented reality because then you could be walking around a kind of ugly street but have it set so that you can see wonderful things mm -hmm. or instead of your window outside maybe you know like in the jetsons or any kind of sci-fi future you can make it look like you're in honolulu mm -hmm. but that um, misses the point entirely yeah and what i love about anne is she's super optimistic and paints these pictures paints over the the gross things the bad things that are happening to her i mean she literally had a brutal upbringing but would paint over like these stories that she came up with in her head but she didn't then just settle with it Later on in her life, she joined a bunch of improvement committees and she was a school teacher and she set out to change the world. Mm -hmm. And I think we can often get stuck, especially with the internet and these like augmented reality situations of like, I don't want to go outside, but I'll watch the live stream of this beautiful beach. That's a little bit silly of an example, but then you're not actually going to go and improve the world. But what you and I tried to do and what we try to encourage people with the solo scene is to imagine a beautiful future, imagine a better version of something, but then take steps to make it happen, even if it's just in your own home or in your own life, because it will then be contagious. So this next fragment section is when Anne is arriving on the island. And as I said, the roads are made of, like everything there is red, all the soil is red. Well, that is one of the things to find out sometime. Isn't it splendid to think of all the things there are to find out about? It just makes me feel glad to be alive. It's such an interesting world. It wouldn't be half so interesting if we knew all about everything, would it? There'd be no scope for imagination then, would there? And I think there would be no scope for imagination is my favorite Anne of Green Gables line and probably the most impactful because often we feel, well, everything's been explored, everything's been invented. I remember when I was a kid, I used to always invent these solutions to things, even like specifically, I remember, you know, baby gates. Yes. I'd always have these inventions for better baby gates that like young kids, because it's like they're to stop the babies, like the small babies from falling down the stairs. Yeah. They're like, but the six year old still can't reach. So I'd always have these ideas for like improved baby gates. And I'd tell my dad all excitedly. And he's like, oh, that probably was already invented. And I remember him saying that about a lot of things growing up of like, I'd have this idea and he'd be like, no, that probably already exists. And I remember every day, this is something I haven't thought about in a long time until now. I'd wake up and basically run through in my head this <laughs> this is so dark I didn't even realize this until now but this motto of like there's probably someone else in the world wearing the exact same outfit as you are today so like you're not unique and I do this like every day as a way to like ground myself in reality not intentionally I mean I was pretty little but I'm just remembering that that was basically the first thing I'd always think when I'd wake up of like sounds more like some kind of ritual <laughs> uh killing of the spirit yeah, I guess I did it to myself. You are nothing. Every day I woke up and looked in my mirror and said it to myself, <laughs> you're worth nothing. So I guess I've been trying to reprogram that for a few years. But yeah, having scope for the imagination, feeding yourself things that inspire imagination, asking questions, even if they're silly questions. You know, teachers used to be like, there's no silly questions. So ask them. It's not, you're not stupid for not knowing why the sand is red. You're just curious and I'm sure someone does know the answer but you have to find out the information somehow I used to feel that every time I would drive not to Prince Edward Island but even in the part of Nova Scotia that's close to Prince Edward Island mm -hmm. the roads are red and I was always would always get really excited because it means we were kind of close to where we were going but also it's just a weird difference it is weird I even feel that way today when we use beats Look how red it is. I know. Colors. Just nature's amazing. Ask questions, be curious, and... Eat beets. Be sociable as well. Because that's what I really like about Anne. She has, as you were saying, the ability to sprinkle fairy dust onto everyone, and it's just... Yeah, you said that, but... Oh, sorry. <laughs> it sounds like something you would say. You're usually the one talking about fairies. Just be more sociable. Finally, be a lover of beautiful things. And not just, like, collecting them, taking pictures of them. Love them like a newborn child. So I'll read one more quote to finish this off and we can talk about it. So this passage takes place after Anne just drove through this, this promenade with these really beautiful trees. The sun was setting, the sky was purplish, and apparently for the first time on the ride back from the train station, she goes quiet for like three miles. She's silent, she's sitting there dumbfounded. And then Matthew asks her, Oh, that's pretty pretty, isn't it? And then she says, 
pretty. Oh, pretty doesn't seem the right word to use, nor beautiful either. They don't go far enough. Oh, it was wonderful, wonderful. It's the first thing I ever saw that couldn't be approved upon by imagination. It just satisfied me here. She put her hand on her breast. It made a queer, funny ache, and yet it was a pleasant ache. Did you ever have an ache like that, Mr. Cuthbert? Well, now I just can't recollect that I ever had. I have it lots of times, whenever I see anything royally beautiful. But they shouldn't call that lovely place the Avenue. There's no meeting in a name like that. They should call it, let me see, the White Way of Delight. Isn't that a nice imaginative name? And then, I just think it's wonderful. She, she was just so struck by the beauty. She's silent for the whole ride. And then she goes off on this tangent and saying it can't be improved on by the imagination, which I love. But then another thing I really love about Anne is that she gives everything names. So she's like, oh, the avenue, ew. Like, let's give it a beautiful name. And she does this throughout the rest of the book and the rest of her life. Even when her, when she gets married to like her childhood sweetheart, they buy a house and they call it the House of Dreams. And her kids call the valley where they played Rainbow Valley. And there's Shining Waters. And it's so funny because in Prince Edward Island, all of the theme parks and parks and everything are named these things. Mm -hmm. I remember a few years ago, like probably four years ago, I finally went to visit Lucy Maud Montgomery's house because in Prince Edward Island, there was this village where they recreated the village of Avonlea. And so that's where we usually go as kids. But then that had been shut down. And I was like, why don't we go see like the actual house where Lucy Mama Montgomery grew up? And then this is where I'm going to get into how it's really autobiographical. And I think that's really cool is right beside the house, there's the, the haunted woods, which take place in the book. But also, if you read Lucy Mama Montgomery's diary, she talks about the haunted woods. And she talks about having these flashes of, of joy that like Anne also experiences and she was she basically is Anne and going to that house was one of the most formative experiences for me where I realized that the fictional world of Anne of Green Gables with all of its optimism and beauty it isn't based on sci-fi it's real Mm -hmm. and we can live a life like this of just loving everything to the fullest and obviously this book is quite conservative in nature of being like we want to like conserve this past but it doesn't I think it's just so wonderful to try and take these values I've just like gone through one at a time and apply them to wherever you are in the world and trying to perhaps you say oh but I don't have any trees like she always talked about how at the orphanage all the trees looked like orphans so when she went to Prince Edward Island they looked like a family yeah and she anthropomorphizes everything like there's two willow trees that she talks to and gives names to and so on and so on. And I just think giving names to things is important and yeah, just loving them. I really like the wording of that passage where she was, as you say, silent for three miles and she said, imagination can't improve on this. It's actually satisfying and she feels an ache. Hmm. Because she doesn't say she feels butterflies. She says it's like an ache in her heart because it's so beautiful. That's how you feel at museums mm. sometimes. Or I mean, we're going to see Dune 2 later. Maybe we'll or Dune Part 2. Maybe we'll see the ache there. But when, when was the last time that you felt that ache or felt satisfied mm. and looking around? I guess a practical piece of advice for this is take your headphones out when you're walking around. That's, yeah. So basically what I was going to say is the last time I went for a walk a couple of days ago and the weather's finally so that you can yeah. like breathe the air and not have to like steal yourself to get from point A to point B. <laughs> so I was able to just like take my mittens off, take my headphones out and just like breathe the air. I've been having these, <laughs> I guess, similar to Lucy Mom Montgomery, these like flashes of just like peace and joy lately as the weather comes back to normal. I mean, everyone is so affected by the weather, but especially in such a cold climate when you have to spend so many months putting on 18 layers and just having no connection to the outside world, really. Yeah, Solacene recommends the first double-digit degree day of the year. Yeah. Final thing I wanted to talk about, which I forgot until now, is why Anne of Green Gables is so popular in Japan. Because, as you said, you've never been to Prince Edward Island, but I remember I went there, as I said, my whole life, but then at a certain point, all the signs started being translated to be English, French, and Japanese. (laughs) And I was like, what? And I like asked my parents and they said 
that Anne of Green Gables is a part of the required curriculum. Basically, after the American occupation of Japan, they reworked the school system so that they weren't teaching everyone to be like soldiers or Bushido. Mm -hmm. They were like, we need to like make people less xenophobic and for some reason chose Anne of Green Gables as the the symbol of Americana. Of America the, and um, Canada, yeah. Or the West. The 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 Miyazaki show probably helped. Yeah, so the Miyazaki show helped. And then in 2014, the woman who translated it, there was this documentary about her life that was published on NHK, which is like their national, like their PBS. Mm -hmm. And so in 2014, the tourism to Prince Edward Island from Japan doubled. And that's why they started doing all of the <laughs> signs in Japanese and stuff. And I just think it's so interesting that this random book from like, from rural Canada went and like has had a global impact. It's been used by a bunch of like political regimes and stuff to say like to combat communism and stuff. It's just, it's so funny. It was not intended to be this political or this global thing, but it has become one and it's really inspiring as someone from rural Nova Scotia. Yeah. And also <laughs> I learned about these two schools in Japan. One teaches you how to, speak English but with a specifically maritime accent so you sound like Anne which I just think is so funny because I don't think I've ever heard of anyone romanticizing the maritime accent and then there's another school for girls that teaches you how to act like Anne which is so funny because she infamously has a really bad temper as I said she like she's quite all over the place but that's, it's yeah that's interesting, interesting. because <laughs> I don't watch too much anime but I feel like that kind of cutesy naive but also having a temper is a very common character traits in anime. Yeah, Nova Scotia to Japan, I guess that inspires you because it's the path that you want to take also. Exactly. And the reason, I mean, when you say it wasn't intended to be any kind of uh, anything other than a story, it wasn't intended to have political mm -hmm. or global consequences, it's because if you make something that's properly, I don't like to use it as an adjective, but aesthetic, Mm -hmm. then it is all those things as well. It's, exactly. e it's ethic as well as aesthetic. Mm. That's a lovely point to close on. So tune in next week for our next episode in the biography semester. We'll see you there.